So good morning. In this webinar, I'll be showing you examples from our recently digitised Married Women Teachers Declarations, which highlight the kind of information that they can provide. The declarations are held in our Public Service Board Special Bundles, which is series number one, NRS 12294. Before we begin properly, I'll just offer an acknowledgement of country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, Museums of History New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. And today I'm coming to you from the lands of the Darug people. So some background information to start with. Between 1932 and 1935, married women teachers were required to submit a statutory declaration to the Public Service Board in order to keep their job. And why did this happen? Well, in 1932, the employment of married women in the Department of Public Instruction, which later became the Department of Education, was restricted with the introduction of the Married Women Lecturers and Teachers Act of number, 19, number 28 of 1933. Female teachers or lecturers who were already married faced dismissal, while women intending to marry were to resign once they married. The government at the time stated that it was designed to make way for the employment of students who were graduating from Teachers College who had been guaranteed employment under the terms of their studentship by terminating the services of the married women teachers. There were provisions in the Act that allowed for the retention of married women teachers on a year-to-year -year basis. So the provisions were things like the teacher might be living apart from her husband and not receiving adequate support. Her combined income from herself and her husband and all sources was inadequate for the support of herself, her husband and any dependents. Or the third option was where the board certified to the Minister of Education that there were special circumstances which made an exemption desirable in the public interest. In order to be considered for an exemption, a married teacher was asked to complete an annual statutory declaration explaining her financial circumstances. Women who were dismissed under the Act or voluntarily chose to leave were compensated with a payout. So they got three weeks salary for each completed year of service and one and a half weeks salary for a completed six months of service. In 1935, the Act was amended from this time, married women who were currently employed didn't have to retire and didn't have to make a statutory declaration detailing their financial situation in order to keep their job. So we don't have declarations after this time, after 1935. However, if you were single in 1935 and later married, you were still required to retire. Here we have a newspaper article at the end of 1935 stating that the cost of compensation was found to be so high up to the end of 1934 that no more than 300 of the married women teachers on the original staff of 837 had been retired. So that left still 537 who were still working. The Act wasn't repealed until 1947 after a long campaign led by Jesse Street the United Associations of Women and Teachers Federation activists. Here we see an extract from correspondence and other papers relating to the Married T Women Teachers Act covering 1937 to 1948 in the Public Service Board special bundles. This is from the minutes of a deputation from the United Associations of Women to the Men Minister of Education in April 1940. Jesse Street here was urging the government to restore to women two of the rights which should be regarded as theirs, the right to work and the right to marry. 
most women applied for an exemption on hardship grounds. So things like the inadequacy of the combined income of the household to support the family. There were those who were supporting husbands who were unemployed by illness or injury. And this is a time where there were a lot of men who were disabled by their service in World War I. And these were people who were married to these teachers. And many were financially supporting other family members as well. And there were also those who had separated from their husbands and were left without fi sufficient financial support. All up, we hold about 693 declarations for exemption submitted by married women teachers between 1932 and 1935. So here is an example of a statutory declaration. This one was submitted by Jessie Maud Jamison, who taught at the Crystal Street Public School at Petersham. So you can see straight off, there's a huge amount of information that's provided giving details of this woman's life at this particular moment. So we have the name and the school that she taught at. So Jessie Maud Jamison teaching at Crystal Street Public School. Her husband's name, address, occupation, employer and regularity of employment. So Jessie's husband is was name was Robert. He was self-employed as a butterman and currently his employment was irregular. He was only getting half days here and there. The stat deck also asked to provide the name and address of the employer. Um, details of the husband's present and weekly income from all sources and the amount he contributed to the maintenance of his wife. So Jessie stated her husband gave her two pounds per week when he could, but the business was bad and he would give money if he had money. She says he's unfortunate, not lazy. You get the names and ages and wages earned by the unmarried children. So Jessie's got three children aged between 21 and 17. How much board was being paid by them? So she only had one paying board at that time. The present weekly income of the husband, which was £2.15. And on the next page, the teacher provides details of her weekly income from all sources. So she's got her salary of £3.01. She's got other sources of £1.78. So a total income there of £4.88. The entire family income from all members of the family was £10.5 and 3 and they were paying nine, nine shillings and seven in the cost of rent for their residence. Here we see a close up of the general information that Jessie had to provide. So her statement, she's here, we find out that she's got three daughters. One was a teacher, one worked for the Registrar General but had a disability and this disability incurred expenses for special shoes and ongoing medical care and her third daughter was getting training as a comptometer operator and also in shorthand and typewriting. The children weren't the daughters of her current husband, were, but were the daughters of a deceased soldier, Lieutenant James Rankin. She has other sources of income from property and an interest in her late mother's estate. Um, and she also notes that her husband's business was very bad, especially in the butter run, as there were so many cash and carry shops cutting the price. And if he gives that up, there's really no work for him anywhere else. Jessie also talks about the health of her husband. She said, physically he's in good health, but he suffers from mental depression and has the idea that he was mad. She says she could more easily explain this in a personal interview if you would care for any further evidence as I do not care to write and I would not let him know I write this much even as he's very sensitive. At one time he was an inmate of a mental hospital. Please keep this matter confidential. I mean as regards my husband's mental state. I'll gladly come in and tell about it in an interview. It's too personal to write but when I came home last Wednesday and told him I had this paper it was pitiful to see him as he thinks he's only dragging me down. I keep this to myself as much as possible as I don't want to be pitied. So as you can see, Jessie's had to provide some very personal details about her family in the declaration. 
So they had to disclose personal information about themselves, their families, their financial situation. And as you saw with Jessie, it could be very distressing and humiliating for them. Like Jessie, many women requested a personal interview with the board to explain their circumstances. The Public Service Board sent out this standard response, a copy of which you can see here. The board is unable to grant a personal interview to all the married women teachers who are claiming the right to such a personal hearing. Representations should be submitted in writing in the statutory declaration. So this is all happening against the backdrop of the depression. In 1932, the official unemployment level reached a peak of 32%. Also in 1932, the government introduced a new basic wage, which reduced the basic wage of males from four pounds two and six to three pounds 10, and from females two pounds four and four to one pound 18. In this newspaper article you can see here on the right, the Minister for Education announces that public school teachers will receive a reduction in their salaries in accordance with the fall in the state basic wage. On the very left, we see Myrtle Parks, a teacher at Newtown Public School, making reference to the wage reduction in her declaration of 1932. You can see she's annotated besides the totals for her weekly income, in brackets, less basic wage reduction. So too does Flora Giblins, who was a teacher at East Sydney Technical College in her declaration in 1935. So she states that she's paying off her home at the rate of two pounds per week. She entered into this contract before the salary reduction. And she talks about all the toings and froings of the money in and out of her house, how her sons are helping her, but they're also paying off their own property at Parramatta. And they're also paying for a course at the rate of 10 shillings a week. And as mentioned, a number of teachers submitting declarations were married to returned soldiers who were incapacitated from war injuries and war service. Flora states that she was estranged and had separated from her husband the year before. He'd left New South Wales and as far as she knew, had not returned since. She said he was a returned soldier and in her opinion, shattered in health and mind and had not contributed to her support for some years now. Flora also makes reference to the impact of the depression on her financial situation. She says she's been unable to honour the obligation entered into before the de depression and had to exercise the most stringent economy in order to secure the medical attention and nursing service she needed for her afflicted daughter. Flora also requests to have a personal interview. She says she would be glad to supply additional particulars at a personal interview if required. Here we see Mary Bardsley, who was a teacher at the girls' primary school at Marrickville. She was also married to a returned soldier who was unable to work due to the effects of serving in World War I. She wrote, my husband's condition Mental instability caused by active service and his term as prisoner of war is steadily becoming worse. He was 60 and this with his ill health, which took the form of frequent fits of morbid depression, preclude him from further employment. He had recently applied for a war pension and she included a copy of the reply from the Repatriation Commission in her declaration. The board stated that they'd accepted his conditions of neurasthenia, nerve damage and gunshot wound in the left elbow as being attributed to war service and that medical treatment would now be provided by, for these disabilities when considered necessary at the Prince of Wales Repatriation General Hospital. Again, this is an example of the level of personal information a female teacher felt necessary to supply in order to try and keep her job. At this time, many women were also helping with the financial support of family members. 
Here we've got Edith Sullivan, a teacher at Bankstown Boys School, who in her declaration from 1934, says she hasn't received any assistance from her husband since 1929, when after a great shock, he left home and hadn't been seen or heard of since. She was helping her unemployed husband, sorry, unemployed son, who hadn't been able to support his wife and child without help. She also reveals that her daughter had died the previous month and she was helping her son-in-law who only had short periods of employment. On the right, we see Annie Thompson, who was a teacher at Birch Grove Infant School in 1935. She's talking about her husband who was recovering from a serious illness and could only do light clerical work offered to him by a friend. She contributes to the support of her mother and sister, neither of whom were getting a pension, and her sister had medical expenses that she also must pay for. And she was the only one left in the family to provide assistance for them. From these declarations, you can see that the, they provide a very personal insight into the lives of the women and also the lives of their husbands, children, and even their extended family. Here we've got Thelma Hitchcock, a teacher at Parramatta Girls School who took a slightly different approach in expressing her outrage at the prospect of being dismissed when the Act was introduced in 1932. She wrote that she desired to protest forcibly and emphatically against your wickedly unjust proposal to dis me, dismiss me, approved an experienced teacher of 25 years experience. I've committed no offence nor broken any regulations. Neither have I failed in any respect to carry out the duties of my position. Yet I am to be subjected to the indignity and shame of a summary dismissal. She says that she'd been promised security of tenure until the age of 60. She had fulfilled her side of the contract and she viewed with disgust the despicable breach of contract now contemplated by a once honourable department. I appeal against the shameful injustice of your dismissal notice. Thelma also points out that it would be detrimental to her students to have to leave when she was dismissed. She writes, I desire to pr protest against my unfair dismissal from the service on the 31st of October, 1932, exactly eight days prior to my sixth A class sitting for their primary final examination. I beg to state that 26 of my girls are competing for high school entrance and four for bursaries, while the other 21 desire passes to the domestic science school, and that would be ch a change of teacher, and the resultant disturbance would be disastrous to their chances in this, the first examination of their careers. So the dismissal of the married women teachers not only impacted teachers and their families, but also could have a negative effect on the students who would be losing experienced teachers at critical times in the school year. There were another reason, there was another reason why married women teachers could be retained. If the board certified to the minister that there were special circumstances which made an exemption desirable in the public interest. Here we've got a document from the Director of Education to the Public Service Board stating it was in the public interest that the services of four married teachers at the Conservatorium of Music be retained. We aren't given any reasons why this was so. We have Mrs Foster and a Mrs Hill who taught harmony receiving fees for teaching and there was a Madame Metters who taught harp receiving fees and also £300 per annum as a member of the orchestral teaching staff and Madame Henri who received fees and £20 per quarter for teaching French. We do hold files for Mrs Hill and Madame Metters but we do not appear to hold a file for Mrs Foster. Although there were many groups campaigning for the Act to be repealed, there were some members of the community who felt it was their right to, duty, sorry, rather, to write to the Minister of Education to challenge the right of a particular teacher to be granted a certificate to continue to work. In our very first example, we looked at Jessie Jamison, a teacher at Crystal Street School at Petersham, 
Well, it seemed a relative of hers wasn't too happy that she was being granted a certificate to continue as a teacher and sent a letter to the Minister of Education outlining why she, she should be dismissed under the Act. She wrote, don't you think it's a shame that Mrs J Jamison is still teaching at the Crystal Street Petersham Boys School? Her relative stated that Jessie's husband had a good butter and cheese run in and about Strathfield, that two of her daughters were working, that she owned three cottages, one she lived in and two she rented out. And then they go on to say the department wouldn't have to pay her much compensation as she's broken service twice. And she writes again, I think Mrs Jamison is one of the many cases which should be looked into. These statements as fact are facts, as I happen to be a relation of the said Mrs Jamison, hoping you will look into this case. Yours sincerely, Mrs M Livingston, 1933. Thankfully, the board saw it a little differently and wrote, in reply to your communication, the board has completed their review and in light of the evidence before them, have issued a certificate for the retention of Mrs. Jamison's services until the end of 1934. Things didn't go so well for Mary Williams, who was a teacher at Curry Curry Infant School. The headmistress there felt it was her duty to contact the department to acquaint them with Mrs. Williams' financial circumstances. The headmistress states that Mrs. Williams had a very favourable situation. She owned a fine home, which was well furnished and carpeted throughout. She had an Electrolux, a wireless, a cabinet Rexanola, a piano player and a motor car. Her husband had been working almost full time since the beginning of the year and had every prospect of continuing. There were no children. And Mrs Williams expressed the opinion that if she was retained for another two years, she would be independent for life. The Education Inspector Gaines stated, this particular case had caused much comment locally. In view of the circumstances of the case, it is recommended that Mrs Williams' services as a temporary teacher be terminated under the provisions of Section 44. And of course, there were a number of teachers, such as Emily Greenway, who taught at Blackfriars Correspondence School, who were willing to voluntarily retire with compensation. Emily stated she was willing to retire, provided she received compensation of three weeks pay for every year of service, together with double superannuation. So at the bottom of this letter, we've got the calculation of what was owing to her for her compensation, a grand total of £677. So next, we'll have a look at how you can find the records for these declarations in the collection on our website. So if you go to our homepage, which is mhnsw.au, and scroll roughly down, you'll find our State Archives collection tile. If you click on Discover More, this will take you to our State Archives Collection homepage. So to search the catalogue, you use the search the collection box in the middle of the page there. And you can search here by a subject or a name or a place. And this will search across everything that's in our catalogue, which includes all of the records that are listed, all of the series that are listed, and any of the indexes. And we'll see an example of this later on. On this page, you can also get to our subjects A to Z, which I've circled now in green on the left there. And this is a good place to look for our subject guides, our indexes and our webinars on a particular search topic all in one place. So for example, school education or school teachers. And it's a good way to get an overview of a research topic. You can also access our Ask an Archivist inquiry service here, so you can contact us for advice and guidance. Now, there is no standalone index for the cards, so the way to, sorry, it's not the cards, for the declarations, so the way to search for them is via the State Archives catalogue search. So for this first example, I put the name Thelma Hitchcock in. So the simplest way, if you can remember the series number, is to put NRS 12944 and then the name of the person you're looking for, Thelma Hitchcock. That will ensure that you're just searching the declarations themselves. 
So the initial search result will look like that what you see in the top right hand, so, sorry, top left hand corner there. So you can see the teacher's name, Thelma Hitchcock. You can see the school she taught at, and you can also see her husband's name there. So you could search by any of those elements. If you click and go to the expanded search result, you'll see the PDF link to the documents there. So I've put a circle around that as well. So if you click on the PDF link and open it up, you'll see the digitised copy there. So there's 21 pages in this declaration and you've got the option to download or to print that out. So I've also circled that bit there. You can search by just a name. Just remember that this type of search will search across everything that's available in the catalogue. So there may be quite a few things that come up for that person, not only the one you're looking for. So for example, we do a search for Edith Sullivan. You can see there's quite a few documents there. We've got probate packets, dependent children's register entry, a divorce file, and also a public service board card there, all using variations of the name Edith Sullivan. But we're only interested today in the NRS 12294 special bundles from the public service board. So if I click on that on the right hand side, I can filter my search to just look for the name in that particular group of records. And if I do that, you can then see just the search result for Edith Sullivan's declaration there. And again, we see the school she taught at and the name of her husband. There she is. You could also search by the name of the school if you wanted to see how many female, female teachers at a particular school were impacted by the Act. In this example, we've used Curry Curry School and I've just used the series number as part of the search to get the results for that series. So I've just popped NRS 12294 Curry Curry School. The other way you could do it, of course, is to search Curry Curry School and then filter down to that series once you get to the search results. And we can see there's just four search results there. So four different teachers were affected by this policy at the time. So that brings me to the end of our webinar today. Thank you so very much for listening. I would also like to thank Rhonda Campbell, who researched and wrote this webinar, but was unable to present it today.